We've got a great group of panelists, and I think some interesting topics that uh, we want to cover tonight, this afternoon. Um, the objective of this session is obviously to get some insight and input from three experienced, seasoned, and successful entrepreneurs, investors in the retail space, get some understanding about what they see as some trends that are going on, uh, what some of the attributes they, they look for in attractive investments that they invest in, and maybe some of the, what some of those attributes are about investments or about business opportunities that they find unattractive. Obviously, the purpose of this, as it relates to 356, is to help you gain a better understanding of your business idea for new places for you to look. We, we call it kind of what sandbox are we playing in, but also so that you can help evaluate your ideas. So to that end, what we're going to do in this evening session is we'll introduce our panelists um, who will share a little bit about their background so you understand where they're coming from. We've got a number of questions uh, just kind of broadly about their perspective. And then we're going to ask uh, as many of you as we have time for to come up and give a three- to five-minute pitch about your business, your business idea, regardless of how detailed and baked it is, the idea this isn't kind of a, uh, an investment <coughs> conference. It really is to talk about the ideas. We'll ask our panelists to share with us their thoughts on what they find uniquely attractive about it and what potentially some of their concerns are. And then lastly, we'll break up and you'll have an opportunity to talk with our panelists and among ourselves uh, and among yourselves about potentially forming teams or about business ideas. Did I miss anything? Um, so allow me to introduce immediately. So I'm Jim Ellis. I'm one of the instructors for 356. Um, immediately to my left uh, is Evan Porteous, who is also um, one of the instructors for, um, for this class. And with no further ado, allow me to introduce our set of um, uh, panelists. Um, and I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves. So, um, Chuck, if you don't mind starting off, telling us a little bit about your background and... Um, and I founded a company called Charles Chocolates three years ago. We're a super premium chocolates brand based in Emeryville. It's my second chocolate company. My first I started when I was 25, a year after moving to California from upstate New York. Uh, after selling that business when my first daughter was born, I consulted to several chocolate companies around the world. And then I also did a couple things with dot coms because I lived here. Uh, <laughs> About three and a half years ago, I was consulting to a chocolate company that basically was very – how do I put this? They weren't listening to anything I was saying. And I went home one night and said to my wife, they're not listening to anything I'm saying. I wish I could do it again. And she said, well, why don't you? And uh, that led to a six-month product development cycle and the starting of this new company. Uh, we just celebrated our third birthday on October 1st. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. My name is Lee Rowden. I am the founder and CEO of Tea Collection, which is a um, children's fashion company that's um, inspired by global influences. Um, our tagline is for little citizens of the world. We started the business in 2002. I was one year out of business school. I um, had always dreamed of starting my own business, but hadn't necessarily determined what that business would be. Um, my business partner at the time was the designer at Esprit, um, and she had this idea that children's apparel didn't need to be all ducks and bunnies, pink and blue. Um, and she was sort of observing what was happening with the demographics of um, parents today. They're a little bit older, more disposable income, more well-traveled, um, and had a slightly different um, aesthetic than what was available in the children's apparel, the children's fashion of the day. But she was a designer through and through. She didn't know, couldn't distinguish a P&L from a balance sheet. So I helped her put together the business plan. Um, and at some point she said, why don't you join me? And so I said, that would be great. So I did. And that was in the fall of 2000. I guess the, we started raising money in the, the beginning of 2002. We raised a little bit of money, got started, and have subsequently um, grown um, and are doing quite well, will be profitable this year, and we're recognized in the Inc. Magazine top 500 companies of, top 500 fastest growing private companies. Great. Um, the San, Bay Area, San Francisco Times, top 100 fastest growing companies, so very proud, um, especially in a space like consumer products and retail where a lot of people will say it's really, really tough. I'm David Faulkner. My background includes department stores for a number of years. 
uh, in different parts of the country, and from there to venture capital right here on Sand Hill Road, U.S. Venture Partners, and I think got board, he, Phil Schlein, mm -hmm. my partner, was a board member of these guys. Um, and then uh, I actually ran a spree. Oh. I was CEO there during the mid-90s for 93, 4, and 5. Ran some other companies and uh, have also been involved with a consulting group that's in the city. So those are the kinds of things that I get involved in. Well, join me in welcoming our panelists. <laughs> so if we could, and I'll start off with a question to, to each and every one of you. Could you I, help us identify some major trends or some changes that are taking place in the industry that may present opportunities for entrepreneurs to come up with business ideas? And along the way, if you can think of any example companies that maybe are taking advantage of that today, that would be it would be great to mention. I, I would just throw out uh, people looking for personal needs to be resolved for themselves, customers. And I always love to start with the customer. Uh, in today's times, there's an article about a woman who is fighting breast cancer, and she has started a company that uh, manages medical records, and apparently it's off to a really terrific start. I mean, that's an example of somebody saying, you know, what do I need, uh, and then growing that into a business. So personalization, I think, is a possible trend that's, that's there. Any other trends or changes that you think? Well, certainly uh, the, the movement from big to small. I mean, these guys represent the best of uh, the new and, and responsiveness to customers as opposed to the big conglomerates in, in the department store industry where I grew up, uh, starting with Federated May Company, Macy's, and Emporium, all of which are now owned by one company, Federated, under one name, Macy's. Uh, there's a tremendous consolidation. But if you look at them, today uh, I think it's true that Macy's is uh, not much bigger than or about the same size as Staples or Home, you know, Home Depot's bigger. It's it just people that started from scratch have dwarfed uh, the department stores, and, and in that sector market share is being lost, and it's being lost largely to people that specialize, and here's a couple of examples of guys that do that really well. Uh, so I think that's an important trend. I've seen some um, interest in you know, ask what other companies we've seen. I've seen um, some people doing some really neat things with customization, which is a, sort of the same idea of personalization, where um, there's a company um, called Tiny Prince that's doing customized birth announcements and Baby, baby shower invitations and sort of family-oriented paper that have photographs on it, and they're doing it um, with a design orientation and, want, and, and able to do this customized printing, um, and they're doing quite well. Um, another company, and these are sort of related corollaries to my children's um, oriented space, but um, a company that's doing customized books for children so that you can put the pictures of your children in the book. So I think people are looking, you, you hear a lot about this customization and do it your own way. Um, that seems really interesting. Um, at the same time, I think one thing that um, I find that's really important when you're looking for opportunities is sometimes, like in my case, I'm selling baby clothes. There have been baby clothes out there since the beginning of the clothes. So it's not exactly innovative that we're doing selling baby clothes. So it was really important for us is just to, to make better baby clothes, to do something that has a little bit, that, that's very brand oriented, and then to execute really well. I always believe that that's as important as the uh, idea itself, is that you, that you, that you um, execute better than your competitors. Lee makes a really good point that it's been around a long time, just like chocolate has mm -hmm. been, but these guys have a different approach. And when you're talking about baby clothes that are sophisticated, well-made, exciting, and there are parents with disposable income that want that, you got a magical connection. So it seems to me that's what you We've done. identified that there are um, this sort of shift in the demographics of parents, and, um, and there was this very slight baby boom that was happening. Um, and in our space, it was in the apparel space, the baby or children 
in toddler clothes was the only segment that was or was outgrowing the other segments, women's and men's. So it's just sort of a basic observation, but um, lots of competition. That's where execution comes in. Um, and kind of similar theme, what I've seen, and this has been happening in a lot of different industries, not just my own, is as companies have started uh, getting smaller, basically it be, they became commoditized, and whether it's department stores, uh, hardware stores, clothing stores, people started then wanting to move away from that and kind of get into things that are more unique, more individual, more that more things that can be seen as their choice. And it's very hard when you're buying the same thing as 25 million other people to be viewed as unique and individual. So it's really moving towards smaller companies, companies that are filling very specific needs that the consumer has. Um, and in our in our business, again, it's, it's taking something that had become a commodity, chocolate, even the really luxury companies like Godiva ended up being completely machine made, uh, all of the natural ingredients having been taken out so that they could gain long shelf life. And all of a sudden people realized that the best stuff out there wasn't the best anymore. And it actually wasn't nearly as good as it was 30 years ago. So the trend basically was to unwrap kind of that industry and, and kind of go back to the way it was. Things being made with good ingredients, being made by hand, being made fresh. And it's no different in almost any consumer industry that we've been watching. Uh, people are wanting things that are, are made with higher quality materials, uh, that are not a commodity, that have some kind of individual flair, uh, and that actually speak to their, their own needs as opposed to kind of the mass market perceived needs. And Lee, maybe we'll start with you. Can you describe some of the attributes that you look for in an attractive opportunity? Or, and maybe the corollary to that, too, being anything that particularly you try to steer away from? Um, within my own business? Within, actually, within business ideas that you see, maybe some others that you've evaluated mm -hmm. as people give you business plans. When you look at things, what are the themes among attractive characteristics or unattractive characteristics? tend to be pretty practical. So I look at the, I look at the need for working capital. It's kind of like <coughs> a basic, basic thing to say. But if you have a, if I'm look, helping someone who's come to, has a business idea, working capital is kind of the name of the game in consumer products anyway, and pretty much with retail also. So what is your cash cycle? When do you pay? When do you collect? Um, do you How much money do you need in order to get started? Um, what are the margins? I mean, it's pretty basic. Um, and then I look at, if I'm talking to someone who um, who comes to ask for my advice, a lot of it, it's the people, always the people. Um, how passionate, how committed, um, how, how much do they believe in what they're doing and how much will they stick to it. Perseverance is so, so important in this, in this space. Um, really comes down to people and money. Um, in my within my own business, when we're considering a new opportunity, it, it's the same thing. So it's um, how much working capital will it need? What's the investment? Who's going to run it? Will it distract us from our own business? What are we, uh, our business is driven by brand and sales. So those two things create value for us. So we cannot compromise on brand and we need to focus on sales. So if it doesn't achieve one or both, both, hopefully, then um, we, we can't do it. It'll be too distracting. Yeah, make, makes sense. I, <clears throat> I think Lee's pointed a couple important things in, in the sort of opposite of what she's saying. I try to avoid certain kinds of things. For instance, commodity businesses that Chuck alluded to that, that uh, where there is low risk, but there's low reward as well and uh, maybe low obsolescence, so there's lots of price competition and very thin margins, so that doesn't do much for the cash flow of the business. On the other hand, I love businesses that have an obsolescence built in, fashion, which is what happens in good retailing, and, I, and here you're seeing two examples of fashion in food and fashion in, in kids' clothes. Um, high reward, higher risk. Um, certainly better margins and more limited competition. I mean, when I think of competitors for year two enterprises, it's not big. There's not a lot of them. 
uh, even though there's lots of chocolate and lots of kids' clothes uh, around. So those would be some. I, I like to always begin with the customer. When the concept comes out, I have to say to myself, the customer's really going to love that, and how do you know? Well, you can just talk to your classmates, talk to your niece, to your spouse, you know, just talk to friends as a starting point, as opposed to doing an expensive focus group uh, on a bunch of research and having to tabulate a bunch of things. Often you can get immediate uh, useful feedback, and then maybe some of that would lead you to go on and do some further research. But I like ideas that are themselves simple, not complicated. And when Lee alluded to before they add another element to the business, they're really careful about that, and that's a smart thing to do. I love to start. I love entrepreneurs that are passionate and who and have integrity. Uh, if you read today's story about front page Merrill Lynch, I'm not sure there was a lot of integrity, uh, even though there are probably good people there. But when somebody says uh, we're going to take a write-off on six billion, and two weeks later they say, "Gee, it's going to be eight billion," something is odd in in that story. So integrity uh, on, on the part of the entrepreneur, uh, to me, is really important. So it's customers, uh, and as Lee said, the people involved, and are they the kind of people I want to work with? Um, the first thing I look at are the people, similar to what Lee was saying, but I take it one step further, which is they have to actually be smart and talented. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't mean it like as, as a lot aren't. But uh, in looking at opportunities, and actually when I was building my own company, and actually based on what Lee was saying about her story, there's wonderful people out there with phenomenal ideas. But if you don't have a team of people that actually can fill every important job within the company, and every, every startup has all of the same needs. They need people who understand sales, understand marketing, understand if it's a product manufacturing, and understand how to manage money. And if you don't have all of those elements in place, uh, sometimes it doesn't matter how good the idea is. So it's it's making sure that the people actually can fill the positions that need to be filled in a startup and do it credibly and, and actually help drive the company towards success. I also look at the, what the market is. Uh, and kind of going back to, to the customer. Is there someone out there or are there enough people out there that will actually buy the product so that even if it's if it's really cool and it's got a great gee whiz factor, does it also have a viable market? And does the product and the team have a likely success of bringing that product to that market? Uh, so it's kind of like making sure the pro the idea is good, but the people are good and can actually execute. But most important, that there's actually people out there that want to buy it. Each of you have kind of touched on this topic in, the <clears throat> in some of your prior co comments. Can you share with us any of your thoughts on where to find good ideas? As you're sitting here and saying, I'd like to be a retail entrepreneur, but I don't know, I'm, I'm not struck by lightning. I don't have a great idea. Any, any thoughts as to where to find them? Um, or also any particularly good ideas that you think may be representative of those kind of um, opportunities to come up with them? Poorly said. The first thing about where you, you know you want to do something in consumer products, you know you want to do something in retail, and then where do you go from there? Um, I, I think what Chuck just said about you have you need someone with sales, product, and mon managing the money. Those are your three buckets, basically. Figure out which bucket you fit in, and then most likely, if you don't have your idea, most likely you're missing that product person. Um, and then I think about where you go find those talented product people. I mean, I, I, for one, I'm not sure I fit in either one of those money manager or sales buckets, but somewhere in between the two I do, but not product. Um, and I have an incredibly talented business partner who knows and loves fashion. She's been sewing since she was three years old. She just loves clothes and loves designing clothes and is quite good at it, and she's been proven in Ed Esprit, Jim Bree, Ralph Lauren, and so on. Anyway... What I found so fascinating is all of her connections are looking for people just like what I imagine most of you are. Um, they want a business side, and they have no idea. They sit in the same room. How do I find someone who has business? So somehow you have to um, match up 
Um, and so typically it's just by crossing that line and going to talk to designers or if it's depending on what space you want to be in, it's finding someone who's a, a product person. I mean, that's one, that's one idea of how to go find that idea. I think another is just to think about yourselves and what you like, want, or need. I mean, for example, I really would like and I really need a uh, universal uh, charger because when my wife and I go to Europe, there's one for the Palm, there's one for the Blackberry, there's one for the Shaver, there's a charger for the laptop. I think we take seven or eight. <coughs> I know there are companies working on this and there's some, you know, in fact, I'm working with one, consulting with them in Hong Kong or in China. But so far, I, I can't buy the product. So as a consumer user, think about very much like this woman did in, in today's paper in the Times. She thought about medical records because it was so complex to deal with the, the docs and the, the medical community, the health care. And so she started what sounds like a really terrific business. So I, I just look at you know, yourselves, your families, friends, and see what some of the interests are. You know, well, your, your partner obviously is interested in kids, and you know, my guess is you are too. Now you know. I am. <laughs> now. Yeah. yeah, well, okay. Yes, I mean, uh, yes. So, uh, I mean, the point there is you, you do something you love. You know, I mean, you can't be passionate about, I don't believe, about a business that's sort of out there, no matter how good the numbers might be, unless you really love it. And I can't speak for Chuck, but I suspect he likes Chuck. He kind of, <laughs> kind of said, bit, yeah. You kind of said that. So uh, that's kind of partial answer. And, and kind of along those lines, I mean, if you have an idea, hopefully it actually comes from a passion. And if you don't have an idea, and like, like, like Lee said, you could certainly go find someone who has that passion and, and play one of the other roles in the business. Every business needs multiple people to be successful. But if you have an idea and, and you're looking to figure out, or if you have an industry that you like and you're looking to figure out where in that industry is an opportunity, the best way to do that, I found, is to go where the innovators are. Now, I'll use my, my own industry as an example. The, the kind of, we call it super premium for lack of a better way to define our market. Premium was taken by companies like Godiva, so we had to go one better. Uh, but if, if you look at our industry in America, there's only about 15 of us in the entire country creating lines of chocolates like mine, and, and that's really fantastic. Go to Paris, and there are 15 in every district. And one of the best ways to see kind of where the trend is going in the industry is to spend a week eating chocolate in Paris. And for every, and it was hard work. <laughs> uh, my, my daughters love that I do this now instead of working in a, in a dot-com doing financial services software, believe me. Uh, but uh, for everything that we buy, there are places like that in the world. And there are people who are innovators in every industry. And, and find out who they are, where they are, and find out what they're thinking and what they're doing. And if you already have an interest in that area, being around the, those products, those people, will, will more than likely spark your imagination and will help drive you towards whatever that next idea is. Pretty much, and Stanford's the wrong place to say this, almost everything out there is evolutionary. Revolutionary is really, really hard. So given that most products and most industries are evolutionary, there are people out there already working on what's next, what's better, what's different, and it's just finding out where they're working on that and finding out where the ideas are being tossed around and trying to kind of insinuate yourself into those places. Great. So we're going to leave a little bit of time at the end for you to give some additional thoughts. We'll have some general questions as well as questions from, um, from students about uh, <clears throat> any of the topics we're covering. But we want to take this opportunity to have some of you share your thoughts about a business idea and get some reactions and feedback from our panel. So do we have any volunteers who want to give a two-minute description of one of their ideas? Um, Brian? Just, just so the idea I have for actually the problem is that uh, when people are doing long-distance endurance events, whether it be running or <coughs> cycling or vultures or endurance racing, the problem they run into is trying to find some kind of real-time data on what their hydration status is. And typically, you only recognize the problem when it's too late. Uh, so the question is whether you can do an indirect measurement to show real-time changes in hydration status and 
look at the trend towards or away from you know, the, the, the proper range of migration. And uh, I think the long-term idea then is to take something like this and probably integrate it with a company like Polar and just dump it out afterwards. Uh, but that's the product idea. So if we Are you an endurance athlete? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually asked not that for, for one simple reason, because it kind of goes to what we've all kind of, I think, been alluding to, which is passion. Uh, and the best ideas that I've ever seen come from people who are trying to solve their own problems. Again, kind of going to the woman in New York uh, with the medical records business. Uh, so <coughs> I, I'm not anymore. Back in my younger days, uh, I used to, I, mean, I was a rower and a long distance runner, and stuff like that is invaluable, and it's a phenomenal market because people are taking better care of themselves, and and you look at the average age of marathoners versus 10 years ago, and it's remarkable how many people are doing endurance sports, and regardless of age almost. It's just really about ability. And, and hydration, Chicago is a great example of how valuable that would have been. And, and if it were easy and if it could be built into a polar heart rate monitor watch or, or some other device, I think it would be phenomenal. Any, any other thoughts? Either, either with on that on that business idea, uh, one of the advantages that you guys have in spades over probably any other subgroup in in the world is your classmates. And you know pr you've probably done this, but you talk to your classmates who are marathoners or athletes, and talk to them about you know would you like this uh, and would it be helpful. Uh, I just think that this class is an enormously important resource. We have already met some of the people in the class. There's people from Spain and from Europe and South America and all over the place. So if Paris, which I agree is a wonderful place to go looking for food and candy, but um, you can find out a lot right here without getting on an airplane. Can I expand so, on that for one second? Because I have a friend who's an MD MBA out of Stanford. The other resource you have here is all of the other schools. Good point. And from engineers to, to docs, you have phenomenal resources that can give you insight into feasibility, insight into technology that may already exist to do this in a hospital setting that just needs to be converted into something portable. Uh, so sensors are probably being developed for this somewhere on this campus. Uh, so, so, I mean, you're, I mean there, there are amazing resources just in – and by virtue of the fact that you're here at Stanford, that go way beyond just resources here in the business school. I get so practical, right? And I just think, <laughs> assuming that the idea is good, which sounds like it's a great one, I certainly cannot um, speak to, to um, I would probably not be a user, considering I don't get a lot of, do a lot of running since I'm working all the time. But um, I, um, then you just think about what's your channel if you're selling, are you, is it a third party software? Are you licensing your software or your technology or are you selling a consumer product? How much money do you need to get it started? Um, what's, do you raise money? What's the return for the investor? Um, can you do it? Do you do it on your own? So, sort of how, how does it get started? And I think a lot of that will, would just depend on it. once you validate the idea, then you put together the plan and make sure that you can check all those boxes. But since it's a technology play, it's possible that it has a, a more uh, – you could raise money, possibly, more easily. Um, our idea was to do like a natural organic um, skin care and makeup line, but a luxury at the luxury end. And right now there isn't a single line out there. And what we were thinking is that some of us believe that it's kind of don't put anything on your skin unless you eat it because it gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And that there is nothing to play with, like nothing that is beautiful. Like there are some lines out there, but they're all pretty, like you know, the packaging is not very nice and they're not marketed in a proper way. So just exploring that whole area of the sort of high end, like a Chanel state, a nice thing you as well, but just doing something natural. Thoughts from anybody's reactions? Surprises me that nobody's doing it. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. It just seems like Obvious. A natural. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is actually a good thing. I mean, if no one's doing it and our immediate reaction is maybe someone should be or might be doing it, I mean, there's obviously something to it. Just for a little market research, how many of the women in the room use something, whether it's the high-end, medium-end, or you know, how many 
use at least something. There's one, two, you know. So, I mean, people are, you know, something's happening. And, and it sounds as though you want yours to be distinctive from probably maybe what anybody in the room is. See what, what they're using. And then, for me, I talked to a, a couple of dermatologists. Um, and, and to Chuck's point, they got to be right here on campus. Uh, I mean, there's some really terrific people in that field um, to see what would be uh, responsible, that would work, uh, so that you can evolve the idea. I mean, I like the idea because there are a lot of women customers out there that <laughs> can sell to. The, yeah. the other thing that, uh, if you haven't done this already, I'm sure that industry has a trade show. Uh, go to whatever the industry trade show is and see what is out there. Because going to local stores or even stores in two or three cities might not give you the broadest view. And there may be things out there that may – they may be incubating. They may be just coming to market or they may have limited regional distribution that could be competitors that you're not even aware of. Um, it's also – because natural cosmetics, I mean – I've got to think it's one of the biggest trends in the industry, just like natural food is one of the biggest trends in my industry. Um, so it would be good to see kind of like the, the big picture uh, of the industry. And trade shows are great for that in any industry. And I would also do a project or an internship with um, one of the companies in the city. There are a bunch of several, at least, cosmetic companies that you could learn a lot probably about competition and then all about the operations. Other business ideas you want to share your thoughts on? Um, a chain or at least something you can be skilled out of fast food or quick service restaurants with the healthy organic folks menu. Kind of like You're not the first one to say those that out loud. Um, there, but some, nobody must <clears throat> have done it. So I think that's somebody. Clearly, people want it. Right. So. But here's a question: Do they? I, I, yeah. Because I mean, when I. The, the fast food industry is probably one of the most mature industries out there. And I, I hate to say people say one thing and do another. But obviously there are lots of people who are, are eating healthier and living better lifestyles. But for some reason, the fast food industry, I mean, the majors have tried it within their own menus. And I've seen a couple very small uh, tries at doing it, like on Chestnut Street in the city, there have been a couple over the years, uh, that just don't seem to take. And the question is, what market research is necessary to find out if people will actually act on their words or their ideals and actually frequent a place like that regularly? Sometimes there may not be anything that you can look at that answers your question directly. Uh, if you look at supermarkets, it, you know, all the big guys, Safeway included, try to do business in the Latino marketplace. They fail every time. They, they have a little aisle, and then maybe there's a sign, and maybe they put on the men's room door uh, Spanish for men. But, you know, that's where that's all it is. Whereas if you go to – there's some stores here in San Jose that are phenomenal – uh, uh, approach to the marketplace that do uh, run circles around the, the uh, sales per square foot of a Safeway in any department they have. So it may not be easy to find what you're looking for, although I, I agree with Chuck, it'd be nice if you can sort of, you know, take a look and see who's done it and who's what's worked and what hasn't worked. But it may be that there's failure because nobody's doing it right. Uh, right, you look at Whole Foods and you you have to believe there are people who are buying it whole foods. Why not where it's prepared? And they actually have a huge amount of prepared food. Mm -hmm. and relative to the total footprint, there's a lot of prepared food at Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. So we'll limit our comments because we want to hear from the panelists. There has never been a class, there has never been a year of this class where that wasn't one of the projects. Right. And <laughs> so, uh, there's, a, there's, there's one that just got funded, just signed a lease. Amanda's Fast Food is opening in Berkeley, and she was a student who, who came through this class. But there have been a long line of those. My, my point not being to discourage, but thinking about the, the exact comments that are up there of, of is there a reason if it doesn't exist, why, and finding that unique attributes that it does have the opportunity to make it successful. Some other idea? Idea is a new uh, restaurant chain of Italian food 
the idea is to bring here to the US the new trends in Italian, basically food places, especially for young people. Now the trends there is basically to get out the young people in very nice places, <coughs> nice music. You buy your cocktail and then you have free food. Uh, it's good, it's simple. Um, it's better than most of the other places around here, I think. Um, <laughs> that's it. It's a way of life more than uh, just another Italian place. But in Italy, it's huge, and I think it can work here. It's, it's a really and good, it's a good point. You know, you can go to Florence, and every corner, every t turn a corner, there's a fabulous little restaurant, and you say, gee, if there was one of these in San Francisco or, you know, in Burlingame, it'd be phenomenal. But some, for some reason, and maybe Jim knows it, I never can find them. You know, nobody does it really well. And they're out there. There's just, there's very few of them. Right. Um, I, I love ideas like that first, and, and nothing against healthy fast food, but if you look at the popularity of Italian food to begin with, you already have a population that loves Italian food. And everyone is looking over time to improve whatever their food experience is. I mean, again, my industry is chocolate. I mean, that's one of the things we capitalize on. But there's no part of the food industry that is immune from that. I mean, look at what's happened to wine, olive oil, homemade jams, you name it. I mean, people are always looking to kind of up that experience. And to bring something that's fresh, unique, has already proven itself, granted, it's the homeland of Italian food, so I mean, it's a little bit of an easier market maybe to, to prove it than here, but it, it's, it goes back to it's evolutionary, not revolutionary, and it's much easier to, to kind of chart a path to success with something that is evolutionary and, in fact, better. You know, don't give up on it. Just because it's not around, it, yeah. it could be a great idea. Uh, just a quick story, a classmate of mine in business school was from, from France, from Paris, and Michelle told me, you know, America, this was a long time ago, didn't have any bottled water, and so Perrier might be good. And I said, oh, Michelle, forget it. That's, you know, nobody's going to pay money here like they do in Europe. Well, I was sort of wrong on that because <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take long before Perrier hit, was big, and then, you know, there's this is huge industry. So, you know, it could be a great idea. You just don't see any evidence here for it. And how do you tell? How do you? Is there is there any kind of signs or things as we try to think about drawing pattern recognition from some of these experiences? Is there anything you can share that that maybe helps you, not with any degree of certainty as we know, but maybe help improve your odds? Well, it's not passionate. If I can use gut instinct as a way to think about something, because that's kind of where you're coming from. Um, I mean, people like Tom Stenberg, with co-founder of Staples, he just had a gut instinct, or, you know, the, the Kinko guy. It was just that there's something missing, something needed, and it isn't out there, um, that you can build huge businesses from it. Uh, I mean, Jim Barry was that way when we funded it uh, at U.S. Venture Partners. And it was uh, just, it really wasn't there before. So I, you know, I would encourage you to, you know, do some more checking and, and you got a research lab right here, do that and see where it takes you. And by the way, and gut instinct is great, but gut instinct that I found is really valuable comes from experience and things that you know as opposed to just like an upset stomach. Uh, <laughs> and, and one of the things that's really valuable is to use other people's gut instinct also. Uh, find people who are in whatever the industry is that, that may be retired, maybe a venture capitalist, an investor. People, by and large, always want to help. Uh, and you can basically get advantage by finding people who are in the industry you're looking at getting into, have done it two or three times, and just sit down and see what their gut instinct is. Because they'll have a lifetime or at least some segment of business life of experience that will be driving their gut instinct. Uh, I'll add one more thing that um, I think that it's there's you can you gut instinct you can um, do the fo mini focus groups with, among your peers. Um, I think another way to do it, or once you've done that, is, is just to do it. Um, 
<laughs> so I, um, when we started our business, I was working in Silicon. I graduated from business school, moved out here, had the traditional product marketing job. And then I met Emily, and she had this idea. I didn't have kids. I'd never really bought baby clothes. I couldn't. I wasn't the responding to a personal need. Um, and I thought, well, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? We're going to spend fifty thousand dollars and buy a bunch of sweaters, and we're going to take them to market and sell them. And people are going to buy them, or I'm going to have a big old sample sale and sell, <laughs> and sell everything for ten dollars. And and what's going to worst thing case scenario? Six months later, I'm looking for a job. Okay. Or six months and four days. I'm just saying you don't want to be stuck with your own idea for 15 years when it's clear that it doesn't work. So, what's the time? I think you have to depends on what it is. At restaurants, I think you could probably talk to some experienced restaurant people and find out when when they know. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Once that you start, let's say that. Right. Yeah. But there's going to be a point in a restaurant's life cycle where they're built, like when we considered opening a retail store, people said you need to give yourself a year to ramp up to get your traffic. After a year, you, you'll know. And so, but where in my business, which is wholesale, I knew after one market if it was going to work or not. Um, so I think it's just kind of industry specific. Yeah. Right. And actually, to play Lee's role of the practical person for one second, it also depends on how much money you have. Yeah. And quite frankly, if you are, get, I agree, just go out and start start a business. I and mean, when you're young and out of school, it's absolutely the best time. I was 25 when I started my first business. And it's great because, by and large, you don't have many responsibilities other than yourself. So it is. What's the worst? What's the worst that can happen? But having said that, you also have to look at if you are going to do that. Do you have enough funding to do it credibly? It would be terrible to spend three, four hundred thousand dollars taking an existing restaurant space, converting it into something that works for you, only to find that there's only twenty-five thousand dollars left in the bank to start operating it. So, so there has to be kind of a practical component to that also. One of the beautiful things about retailing is speed. Typically, when something new comes along, you can almost tell. The, you open a store the first day, it's either a winner or it isn't. And, and so th that's one of the things that attracted me to it. I have a <coughs> low tolerance for long-term kinds of you know investments where I'm building a pipeline from Houston to Ohio, and it takes 10 years to see whether the ROI is there, whereas in retailing, uh, as I was telling one of the guys up here I was talking to, when I went to work for a department store, the buyer told me to go out to the hotel, and there was a salesman for neckties, and he had dotted ties and striped ties. And he said, go buy them. And I said, God, I'm investing Federated's money here. And it was a little scary. And so I bought these ties, and they came through the ship, and I ran up to the shipping room, and I sped them through and put them on the floor. And the dots all sold out, and the stripes didn't sell at all. You know, just not one. So I had a big mark down on one, and, and I reordered the other. But instantly, you know, the answer. So, and that's that's just observing, talking to customers, watching what they what they do. That's that's the fun of retailing. And food, by the way, is very fast. Right. And I remember the day World Wraps opened on Chestnut Street, the very first one. The next day, the owners, it was a Sunday, open on Saturday, Sunday, the owners were in Safeway in the marina buying more stuff because they didn't anticipate how popular they would be. So people, when they like a food concept, they rush to it because everyone's looking for a neat new food concept. I have a question. I love this idea. How do you think, from a retail standpoint, about distribution? So you can open your own store. You know, do you guys put the makeup in the open your own store, or do you put it in Sephora? Well, we we have we have multiple channels of distribution, but our smallest one is our own stores because there's only one. We have 500 stores that we sell to wholesale. Uh, when you look at it, you have to look at what also is the most efficient way to get to market and to start building your brand. Because if you are coming out with something that has a unique sales proposition, it's a very competitive world out there. And you want to make sure that you get out there and start establishing your brand pretty quickly. One of the most expensive ways to do that and one of the ways that has probably the highest failure rate is to open your own stores. Um, it's more expensive from a business perspective 
to go wholesale because you're selling basically at much lower margin to yourself, but your cost of doing that is also much lower. And you just build it into your margin. I mean, you, you build your model so you can support a wholesale distribution business. Uh, retail and owning your own retail shops, if you've got something that demands that, some concepts can't be wholesaled. Some products can't be wholesaled because there aren't other mass retailers out there that are going to buy it. So if you don't do it yourself, it can't get to market. Uh, so sometimes you're stuck with that, and then you just have to be very careful. And the one thing I've learned in 20 years in retail-oriented businesses is there's really something to the location, location, location thing. Uh, you need to be where your market is if you ever do anything in retail. And then finally, uh, there's other avenues. There's the web. There's other ways of getting your product to market that are less traditional that are also really viable. Um, I've been reading articles lately about like the proliferation of in-house parties for pretty much every product, the Tupperware model, basically. So there's other ways of looking at, at f I mean, getting a product to market and also testing viability in the marketplace without having to open your own stores. This is actually one of the biggest, ch one of the biggest challenges of the teams coming through the retail and consumer products kind of with their ideas in this course struggle with. So if we could, just take a couple minutes and share your thoughts on that, if you wouldn't mind, Lee and David. Wholesale is very – so the economics aren't as good from a gross margin point of view, but they're um, much better from an inventory point of view. So depending on your nature – depending on your um, product life cycle or your um, production time and depending on – I mean, a few things. But for me – Perishability. Perishability. <laughs> this is true. So for me, I um, work with all – we sell also to about 500 different stores, and we get 90 percent – or that's our goal anyway – of our orders in – before we place order with the factory. So we have very limited inventory risk. Um, whereas if you go direct to consumer, you have to stock everything. You don't know if people are going to buy it or not. So I always feel that the direct to consumer route, you're rewarded for that extra risk of inventory. Um, I also think it matters where you're manufacturing. So for me, I can't do a small run. So I can't sell a 1,000 of the same sweater in one store if we did open one. Um, I need to just you know, move it out across the whole country. And then lastly, on the um, location, 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 um, our second season we sold to Barney's. Um, Barney's is great from all levels. From That's where our customers are. It's a great test market. Plus it's anyone who's opening a store goes to New York, shops Barney's, and all of a sudden it's like marketing for us. So we get a lot more calls because of that. So I think there's a, there's a lot, there are a lot of reasons to do wholesale. Um, I think in a lot of ways that was our best marketing strategy. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I can lean both ways because when I was involved with Esprit, mm -hmm. uh, it, we did both. We had, mm -hmm. did wholesale, and we also did retail. Uh, it turned out that the retail, uh, because of the costs uh, and it's capital intensive that Chuck alluded to, the outlet stores far outperformed the regular price stores. And before I got there, there was a point of view that these regular price stores would be terrific. There was, they were in Valley Fair and here, but they were terrible. Uh, we were just taking a bloodbath in them, whereas the outlet stores performed well. So from a distribution standpoint, I, I think it depends a lot on who the customer is and where they are. When you, You've got a very distinctive clientele, and, and, uh, and it's great that you can spread out in lots of different places because you're not going to sell a 1,000 in one location of the kinds of clothes that um, Lee is making. So, yeah. So we've got a minute to do one, <coughs> thoughts on one more business idea, and then... Um, Why don't we, uh, we'll ask again for kind of closing thoughts, if you might. So Sean and I worked on a project in the upper level CS class in which we developed a product for uh, teenage old girls. It's these charm bracelets, but they have RFID chips inside of the different charms. The idea that uh, girls can trade these charms back and forth, and then they can add photos or sounds or writings online to these charms. So if you go back to your computer and it has an RFID sort of scan, it'll recognize that you're there. And then all of a sudden you can see all the photos of your, your friends or the person who had that charm before. Do you think that is, you know, realistic or interesting because there's the online component and also the retail component of the, uh, the bracelets. I would talk to Chuck's daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Actually, my youngest is just e exiting the webkin space. <laughs> and what that says, I mean, to me, what I think of is what's after webkins. And I, I actually think there's kind of a, a cool 
kind of opportunity there to take kids who are now computer savvy and web savvy at a much younger age uh, and channel a lot of that energy into something that is probably a little bit more positive on the internet as well. As a parent, uh, obviously that's always a concern too. Uh, and then you look at charm bracelet crazes and, and it's very cyclical. I mean, I've seen them over the years, there are like periods of time when that's like the biggest fad. There are periods of time when no one would wear them just because it would be like a fashion don't. So you, there, there, there are like several issues in there, but I, I think the germ of the idea is really pretty cool because you've got uh, a, a, a web savvy set of young women all over the country and you've got them kind of in, it sounds like the thing that would slot in perfectly <coughs> between the different sites for little kids and the ones that high school and college kids would be more interested in, which are inappropriate for kind of like young teenage girls. And to a point Lee made earlier, it's the kind of thing you can try quick and at low cost. So, you know, first I talk to Chuck's daughters, and then I just go do it. You know, it's just one of those things that sort of cries out, it sounds like a cool, neat idea, I just do it. Yeah, lots of contract manufacturers for charms, and obviously our right. ID chips are now getting to the dime a dozen stage. And then there's some creativity <laughs> with what, what goes in them, you know, what, what, right. the, what the yeah. messages are. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the creative that's side, but, but Lee made that point, too. She has a partner who does that kind of stuff. She doesn't do economic models all day. No, definitely not. Um, the, the, if you can just do it and try it, it seems like the way to go. Yeah. Um, my, in my business, we um, we do try to avoid selling to children. I mean, concept concepts because I find them very fickle, and what's popular and what's not, it's it's very challenging. So our clothes go up to size eight, but we sell much more of the clothes where um, parents are still making the decisions. But the older they get, the kids make the decision. Uh, it's just really hard to follow those trends. But if you hit, you hit. Right. Yeah. Right. And actually, one thing on that, I mean, I call it the Jerry Lewis in France effect, which is there are markets that you may not recognize uh, that will take to something even if the market you originally thought of doesn't so quickly. And, and sometimes a friend of mine started a company called PB Wiki with a very specific market in mind, and his biggest market was one that was never even on his radar, uh, which is like school teachers and school administrators. So, so. There are, and part of it is actually kind of going back to the idea of find out if there is a market and where it is, but don't focus too narrowly on a specific market because it could come from left field because the application is just better for that and you just didn't know it. So before we get your wrap up thoughts, what I want to do is since we do have a mixer afterwards and this will be an opportunity for people to very quickly, those of you that we didn't get a chance to, to ask our panelists <laughs> thoughts on their ideas, if you wouldn't mind, put up your hand and we'll just ask you to say briefly about what your idea is and we'll just go around the room so maybe um, it'll lead you to connect with somebody. My kind of combines retail and finance and tech. It's uh, merging credit card processing networks with consumer data informatics. Most. Lingerie for women that is comfortable, makes them feel great. And in a company wholesale that actually listens to the customers. So it's the need is um, consumer uh, food and grocery manufacturers, Coca Cola, and they were buying <coughs> sample. They need data, real time consumer data on store sales in the small mom and pop grocery segment. Uh, focusing more on countries like emerging market countries like India, China, Russia, Brazil, and any other country. So those are the major markets. Um, right now, Nielsen provides that data, um, but it's, it's not real time data. So There's a big opportunity. We were, we were, and I were thinking about looking at designing kind of designer scrubs, like well fit scrubs mm -hmm. aimed at at actual doc, not nurses, but doctors and surgeons. We're both at the med school. <laughs> <laughs> we just thought that scrubs are pretty bad. <laughs> we just thought that it would um, kind of play into the idea of status <laughs> in this country and kind of give people something, more options to wear to work. Uh, my day is a full service rock climbing gym. So instead of just going to a gym and kind of working out, it would have a full set of community services, and once you could develop a community there, you could sell people guiding services, recommend international trips, sell them outdoor equipment. 
Um, Pirate Day is a men's, uh, menswear line that focuses on accessories, which is comprised of uh, neckties, scarves, pocket squares, belts, suspenders. Um, aesthetically, it's an American brand that's, uh, that's elevated to the level of European manufacturing and updated to the uh, kind of youth of, of a lower Manhattan to uh, no leader and that good chance. And sells um, uh, multi channel predominantly to start off with through uh, wholesalers, boutiques, um, boutique, and game opening up wholly owned stores. Any other ideas? Yep. Um, well, mine's not really the retail industry, um, but 356 splits you into four categories, and I thought this might, might be the most appropriate. Um, <laughs> Latin America is very fractured in terms of airlines. Um, you have big legacy carriers from each country, um, and the Andean region of Latin America has just signed what is called an uh, Open Skies Agreement and a Free Trade Agreement, and there is no real substantial transportation infrastructure between those countries. Yet they're, 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 they're growing, their economic growth is there, and so I believe that there's a real opportunity to start up a low-cost carrier in Latin America. Hi, um, Omar. Drawing on my own experiences um, throughout college and the first couple years afterwards, I bartended, and I found that there's a lot of things about bartending that I love, but there's a lot of products that either A, are very cheap, and I'm even trying to go find them, but you know, it's either you get the dirt cheap, or spouts when you pay for the most expensive ones. And then I don't know one bartender that doesn't hate cutting lines. And as a mechanical engineer, I looked at it and I'm like, there's a whole bunch of ways you can get something really quick that you can just interchangeably have blades and come down. So I've got a lot of good ideas just for, like, basically bartending products that would sell mainly to, to restaurants and stores that would shave on prep time. So presumably they would pay because they could lower the labor costs considerably. So. Great. Last one, are we good? We good? So we'll just turn to, to each of our panelists and ask <clears throat> in just a couple minutes, is there any advice that you want to share in, in general terms, kind of closing thoughts or reactions, really the, the time's yours, a couple minutes of passing on some words of wisdom to these budding entrepreneurs. I'll, I'll start with whatever the idea is, make sure you can articulate it in the elevator pitch so the, it takes a very short amount of time because that's kind of all you get often with somebody who's a potential investor. Uh, and uh, so you, you spend a lot of time on honing that down so that it's really like breathing out and breathing in. And we also tell students, if you can't do it, you probably don't understand it. <laughs> good, well, good, good point. Um, when I always... Um, it's so basic, but uh, know what you want. Know why you're doing it. Are you doing this to become a huge company? And probably most of you are because you're here at Stanford. But are you doing it for a, a lifestyle? Or are you doing it for a big exit? Um, and let that guide all your decisions from your fundraising all the way through to how you set up your business and who you hire. Because um, it, it's, it seems really obvious, Maybe, but it's it's really deserves some soul searching. Um, and then I would say trust your instincts and and try. I'm a, just a big believer, and there are a lot of people. And in, in the, in the longer you wait, the harder it gets because you have more at risk. You have a, a family or a mortgage or a or a office with a view and a secretary, and all of a sudden, <laughs> do you really want to go? Down to Potrero Hill, and you know where my office is, and you, um, you know, there definitely no secretaries <laughs> at our office. Um, so, is that really is that the life you want? And, and and if you really are passionate about your idea, then I'm sure it's the trip that you do. But give that a lot of thought before you pull the trigger. On more the emotional side, we are all prone to self-doubt, and this is not an easy thing. Starting a business, it's fraught with risk. Uh, there's pretty much at every turn an issue that's going to pop up in front of you that's going to make you question why you're doing it. Uh, try to avoid self-doubt. I and mean, If you have an idea, if you have a team, if you have funding, have confidence and, and just really make sure that you have kind of the ability within yourself to persevere and to stick with it because nine times out of ten, 
that will get you further than almost anything else, uh, quite frankly. I mean, the idea's got to be good, but you've just got to have it within yourself to, to take the risk and follow through and to keep pushing even when everything around you says maybe it's time to quit. And actually, I want to give one example. I apologize. There's a, there's a chocolate company in Los Angeles. Uh, most people don't even know it exists. And uh, I hired my vice president of operations away from Scharfenberger in Berkeley when they sold to Hershey's because he didn't want to work for Hershey's. But before that, he came from this company in L.A. And basically, he calls it the third time is the charm story. Twice, the company almost filed bankruptcy and almost closed. But the owner of the business was so confident in his ability to see it through and to, to make it happen that ultimately he did, and now they are very, very successful, making private label chocolates for the likes of I mean, Walmart and, and Target. Uh, and it's really that, more than anything else, that's a story of perseverance. I mean, the odds were telling, the, the business was telling him maybe this isn't the right thing to be doing right now. He thought he knew better, and he was right. And it's just because he was willing to, to persevere at pretty substantial <coughs> personal sacrifice uh, and make it happen, and it has. Great. Well, please join me in thanking all